Um, okay, so here we are again. Uh, this will be basically the first, you know, real class. Um, and so for this class, we're going to go over um, the essay by Sheldon Wolin on inverted totalitarianism, um, as well as the article I wrote about the uh, uh, double standard in American politics. So right off the bat, I mean, Wolin's argument for America essentially becoming more of a totalitarian country is obviously a very, you know, provocative argument. Um, essentially, what he's what he's doing is, you know, basically drawing a comparison between the United States and Nazi Germany, which is the most, you know, well-known example of a totalitarian government, although may maybe not the only one. Um, now, I think that, you know, Wolin does kind of, you know, hedge his bets a little bit. He, he uh, describes it as an emerging form of government within the United States. In other words, you know, acting as if we're not quite there yet. Uh, Wolin, by the way, you know, died in 2015, right before Trump was elected president. Um, so I'm curious how he would have, uh, you know, interpreted that um, as far as the, you know, direction that the United States is moving in. And this this article originally dates back from 2003, uh, you know, during the, 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 the run up to the invasion of Iraq. And that was a very, you know, powerful influence on, on Wolin's, um, you know, viewpoint on this issue <clears throat> and sort of where, where he was coming from. Um, so, you know, this article or this short essay was later expanded into a book. Um, and in the book, he, he coins a new term, what he calls um, manage, manage democracy. And that's kind of his term. You know, I think, I think he, the, 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 you know, using the term totalitarianism is kind of, you know, problematic <laughs> in many ways. Um, so he uses this other term, manage democracy to describe the United States in that it is basically what he's saying is that it is basically managed by people at, at the top. Um, and that essentially democracy in this country is very quickly becoming a kind of formality. There are sort of these sort of empty rituals of democratic government that we go through. Um, but there, there's just sort of like hollow forms, you know, form without substance. In other words, elections could be a key, you know, a, 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 a good example of that. You know, the whole notion of elections presumes, of course, that you have a choice in, in who you're actually, you know, voting for. But what if you don't really have a choice? What if it's just kind of, you know, more of the same? Um, in that case, then, you know, an, an election would just be kind of a formality. I mean, that's that's kind of in 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 line with the argument that Wolin is trying to make. Uh, now, what, what I have up here is a typology of Aristotle's, you know, um, categorizations of different types of government. And you can see that there are several types articulated here, most of which are not very, you know, relevant today, like monarchy and things like that, our aristocracy. Um, but the terms oligarchy and democracy are important. Um, now, you might notice that these are described as perverted forms of government. So basically, for Aristotle, there are you know, good types of government, and then there are sort of like their mirror opposites, their 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 evil version essentially, or their bad version. And he classifies a democracy as one of those types of government. But what does he mean by democracy? And I think this this sort of gets into um, you know some of the stuff I was reading in, in people's um, discussion posts for for this class. It seems like most people pretty much maybe take it for granted that we're still living in a democratic government. Uh, many people use dictionary definitions to you know to base that on uh which is okay i guess i mean the thing about that though is that you know if you if you understand that we live you know if, if you take a materialistic view of society the society that, that we live in is fundamentally shaped by the economic conditions of the society and what that means in other words is that since we live in a capitalist society that our political values and our, our 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 views on many things are kind of shaped by that to a large extent so i i'm assuming when people use a dictionary definition what, what they're trying to do is is, is given a sort of an, an impartial source or a very you know generic kind of kind of source but you're presuming that it's impartial and and you can make an argument that that definition since it emerges out of a capitalist society is a very sort of you know capitalist or very kind of you know bourgeois notion of of democracy and i i think that's that's pretty much true now for aristotle the way he defined democracy was basically 
ruled by the poor. Um, I mean, that's essentially how he argued. And, and, and oligarchy was ruled by, by the wealthy, ruled by the wealthy elites. Um, and he takes these terms over from Plato, but he specifically gives a more economic interpretation of them. He's not correcting Plato, because Plato un understood that as well. You know, Plato, the other important Greek um, thinker. Um, but what he 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 wants he really went out of his way to emphasize the economic notions of these terms. So so in a very again generic sense, democracy means rule by the many or rule by the people. The demos coming from the Greek, you know, these are all obviously Greek terms. Demos coming from from the Greek word for people. So rule by the people. The oligarchs are ruled by the few, um, and that's kind of the way the Plato define those terms. But again, Aristotle really went out of his way to say like, well, no, when you're talking about the few and the many, what you're really doing is talking about this in economic terms. You're talking about the wealthy elites in the case of the oligarchs and the the poor, basically, in the case of democracy. Um, and again, Aristotle described both forms of governments as be basically being bad forms of government. Um, but he did also say that, you know, democracy may be a bad form of government, but it's also the least bad form of government. An interesting uh, uh, distinction to make. Um, so he would prefer democracy over oligarchy for 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 the most part. Now the the so called good version of democracy is what he calls polity, and it can be you know translated in various different ways. But basically, what 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 he's calling the good or the ideal version of rule by the many, as it says here, is basically closer to what how we would define democracy today constitutionalism a republican form of government things like that aristotle's version of democracy would be closer to what many people would today call direct democracy where the people directly vote on 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 everything um in other words without a representative system of government to vote on laws at least um even even those governments still had sort of you know representatives to carry out the day-to-day -day tasks of government but the people would sort of vote on the laws directly uh and you know, several centuries later you know the political philosopher rousseau would kind of you know r resurrect this idea as well so anyway so so when aristotle is talking about a polity a polity for him is basically what we would today consider to be um you know a democratic republic or a liberal democracy or a constitutional democracy so on and so forth but anyway i mean going back to what Wolin is saying um i think there's a very good argument you can make that the united states is basically becoming an oligarchy is basically becoming a system of government that is essentially ruled by the wealthy elites, by the wealthy few, again, as Aristotle would say. And I think this relates to basically what, what Wolin is talking about. So again, I, I mentioned this a little bit last class, but you know why this somewhat confusing term of inverted totalitarianism? Um, basically, I would say the idea of classical, if you could use that term, classical totalitarianism uh, is expressed by the formula politics over economics. In other words, the state, whether it's in Nazi Germany, whether it's in the Soviet Union, basically takes control over the economy. Production, you know, price levels, wage levels, things like that are all basically determined by the government bureaucracy, at least at least for 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 the most part. Um, the inverted version of this, the the upside down version of this, would then be economics over over politics. Um, again, where where you know basically you know corporations, financial interests, Wall Street banks, and things like that essentially take control over politics in in this country, which means the government, the political parties, the media, um, all the things which are sort of you know essential for democratic government. I mean, you, because because the media is very important. You need a, you know a, you know a free flowing, open access to information. And communication. If 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 you don't have a well-informed electorate, then you don't really have a democracy either. That's another important thing to keep in mind. Um, and again, and I think you know to some extent, Wolin kind of backs away from that term a little bit. You know, using the term totalitarianism, but this idea of economics, you know, sort of increasingly dominating, you know, the political realm, I think is important. And I, I think it's sort of you know preserved in his later term, what he calls managed democracy. So this is a, 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 a key passage from this article. Um, and he basically runs through the different, you know, institutions really quickly and, and sort of shows how they've all been sort of, you know, subverted or corrupted or, or something like that. And 
again, you know, Wolin does ultimately say that you know, this is an emerging form of government. So I think he's still willing to say that, yes, we, we probably live in a democracy or that we're in a democracy in, in, in the process of transitioning to an oligarchy. Um, and, you know, and I only emphasize this because, you know, based on my impressions when I was reading in the um, discussion assignments or the discussion board, is I didn't really get that sense from 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 people. I mean, like, I think people kind of like, like, yeah, we live in a democracy. There, there, there's some issues, but you know, otherwise everything's okay. I mean, I mean, that's kind of my impression um, reading uh, what, what I've read so far. And I just think there, there should probably should be a greater sense of urgency that, you know, even if you can still say that we live in a democracy, you know, democracy is basically on life support in this country, or, you know, it's basically hanging on by a thread. Um, and again, there'd be many people that, that would already say we've already sort of, you know, made made the transition into an oligarchy at at this point i mean i mean how can you vote against the interest of, of wall street and large corporations in the united states i mean who 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 can you vote for that represents an alternative to that i don't really see it and and so when you look at what Wallen says here he he emphasizes that as well so i'll read this real quick he says the, thus the elements are in place um a weak legislative body meaning meaning the congress um, a legal system that is both compliant and repressive. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting term. What, what he means by that, by being compliant, is that, you know, basically, you know, the courts let the government do whatever they want. You can spy on people. You can, you know, um, you know, violate their constitutional rights and things like that. And 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 the the, the courts and, and the legal system is not really going to react to that too much. But if you're a poor person, what do you have to deal with? You have to deal with a very sort of draconian, very, you know, tough legal system that locks people up for you know relatively minor crimes nonviolent offenses and 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 things like that so you know once again if if you're wealthy or if you're well connected you know the laws don't really apply to you but you know again if if you're poor basically or don't have connections you know the legal system can can be very tough um a party system in which one party whether in opposition or in the majority is bent upon reconstituting the existing system so as to permanently favor a ruling class of the wealthy, the well-connected, and the corporate, while leaving the poorer citizens with a sense of helplessness and political despair, and at the same time keeping the middle class dangling between fear of unemployment and expectations of fantastic rewards once the new economy recovers. Um, again, I would say that's that's very accurate as far as how the political parties work. First of all, we we only have two. Right, most mo most other countries, you 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 have more more than two choices. We we have two, you know, major choices at least. I mean, technically there are third th third parties, but I think everyone knows they don't really stand much of a chance of actually you know winning um, um, power. Um, but the two parties that that we have, yeah, I mean, like it doesn't matter which party that you vote for. It's it's impossible basically to vote against the interests of Wall Street. It's impossible to vote against the interests of corporations. It's impossible to vote against the interests of the Pentagon. Every year the government passes. A military budget, which which you know shatters you know the, the the previous year's record for military spending. And the funny thing about that is that the the military budgets are actually higher than what the military even asks for, which is already asking for a lot. Um, and and there are you know reasons for that. I mean I mean um, members of Congress compete for for you know military funding in the, in their states, um, military bases. It's it's you know pretty openly acknowledged thing or, or, or you know basically a job program. For, for people because we have so many people that can't find, you know, decent paying jobs. A lot of them get absorbed into the military and things like that. So members of Congress basically compete very hard actually to get those military dollars and to keep these, you know, military uh, bases running in their states. Um, and when I say that, you know, you can't vote against the interests of Wall Street and corporations, I mean, I think that's true. I think there are different probably factions. I'm not saying all corporations have, have, have the same interest. Some of them want free trade. Some of them want, you know, protections against imports and things like that you know they they have different interests but either way it's it's it's, it's sort of different factions of corporate elites the idea that democracy meaning rule by the people the common people you know the people who aren't you know super wealthy and things like that i mean the government routinely ignores what people want i mean i mean you 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 can see a great gap on any number of issues between you know um public opinion, popular opinion on, on issues and what the government act actually does. Most people in, in this country favor, you know, single payer health care. Most people in this country think a woman should have a right to an abortion. Most people in this country are concerned 
by by the growing concentration of wealth in, in this country and, and and things like that. So those are all things that that, that that there's a strong preference for. Yet nothing happens. And 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 if we take the idea of democracy seriously, that it is government by the people, government by by the common people. Well, what does it say when 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 the when the preferences of the common people are you know routinely ignored? And then, of course, you also have to get again to the 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 issue again, going back to the media. You know, to what extent are are people basically sort of you know brainwashed basically in, in, into supporting things that are against their interests, whether it's their short term interests or their long term interests? Um, anyway. He, go, he goes on, perfect timing. He says, that scheme is abetted by a sycophantic and increasingly concentrated media. Sycophantic means basically, you know, uh, you know, like butt kissers, basically, suck ups. The media, instead of, you know, again, holding the government accountable, basically functions as propaganda for the government. And, and, and again, you know, in, in the context of the invasion of Iraq, very, very uh, noteworthy there. I mean, I mean, the track record of the media leading up to the Iraq war is abysmal. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Maybe you're too young or whatever, but go back. And, and I mean, there are any number of articles you, you could find, you know, a, 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 a good amount of evidence to s suggest that, that the media is overwhelmingly uh, supportive of the war and did not criticize the Bush administration at all. And and why? I mean, I mean, I, I, any government you should criticize, but especially the Bush administration. I mean, these, these are the same people that's you know stole the election the year prior to that, in two thousand, um, and and that still continues today. And you know, and I'll I'll go, I'll go into some of the you know ma you know major failings of of the media in this country, but but certainly near near the top of the list, if not at the top of the list, is that is that the the media in this country is 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 horribly pro war. I mean, the media loves war. And the media never questions the government when they want to start a war or support a war or anything like that. I mean, we see that now as well with the Ukraine and things like that, uh, or with China, which is, I think, the, the, the next big threat that's sort of being, you know, built up for the United States as well. Um, a concentrated media, again, there are basically, you know, five or six companies that control like 90% of media in this country, movie studios, television networks, radio networks, publishing internet websites i think that pretty much covers everything but you know if anything else i'm, I'm sure it's owned by these uh you know massive media conglomerates as well i'm talking about disney i'm talking about time warner uh news news corporation by rupert murdoch who owns fox news and, you know conservative media um okay by the integration of universities with their corporate corporate Benefactors again, another interesting topic. I mean, I mean, um, yeah, I mean that's a very important thing. Academic research in in this country is basically shaped by corporations, shaped by the government. Do you think that they're going to really fund projects that go against their interest in, in any significant way? Plus the fact that the, the universities are now basically run as you know a for profit business. You know they charge increasingly higher amounts of tuition, whereas you know many schools, at least public colleges in in the United States used to be you know free or very low tuition um you know they're they're out there to make money now um many universities are big landlords as well nyu from what i've read is is like the largest landlord in new york city they own more property than any other entity or organization within within the city of new york and you don't think they make you know money on that so, I mean, that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Um, by a propaganda machine, institutionalized and well-funded think tanks and conservative foundations, by the increasingly closer cooperation between local police and national law enforcement agencies aimed at identifying terrorists, suspicious aliens, and domestic dissidents. Very uh, loaded term there as well. And again, I mean, I mean, for people that are maybe in my opinion, a little more complacent about democracy in, in, in this country. I mean, what, what is he saying here that's, that's, that's not true? I mean, he's basically, you know, run through a good amount of the institutions within the United States. What, what's he, you know, find the lie, basically, as, as, as people say. Well, you know, what is he saying here that's not actually true? And I think if, if you take this as, as, as a whole, I think it's very hard to argue that we still basically live in a functioning democratic government. I mean, I mean, at best, I, I think you could say, you know, it's basically the sort of like hanging on by a thread. There are some remnants, there are some vestiges 
of a former democratic system of government, but they're they're rapidly you know falling away. By the way, you, you know if you use even the sort of standard generic definition of definition of democracy, it at least it assumes that everyone has the right to vote. So even by that standard, I mean the United States did not really become a democracy basically until like 1965. You know because again uh, until until then you know African Americans within the, the United States basically did not have have the right to vote. Or, or, or the right to vote was very insecurely held. And again, voting rights is, is, is another major issue. I think somebody brought, brought that up as well. Um, it is. And how can you say that you live in a democratic country when you know people are denied the right to vote? And of course, they were in a very systematic way, basically, like I said, up, up until the 1960s. I mean, think about that and the whole history of this country. Um, and I would argue that, you know, in many ways, the the, the sort of drift to a system of what he calls managed democracy or oligarchy has really sort of taken place basically since the, since the 1980s. And I would say in many ways is kind of a backlash, kind of a reaction against the movements of the 1960s, but which is probably, you know, at least in, in recent times, the, the sort of high point of radicalism within, within the United States, even, even lasting until the 1970s. But basically everything since, since since the 1980s has been this sort of massive conservative backlash against those things. And even that, I mean, I mean, I mean, how do you, you know, interpret American politics in the context of the whole world? I mean, I mean, America is, is an incredibly conservative country. Um, the Democratic Party would be considered basically a right wing party in almost any other country. Bernie Sanders, who's supposedly the most left wing, you know, um, candidate in the public spotlight, at least, w would probably be considered like a moderate in most other countries, like, you know, like in the center, not left, not right, but sort of in the center. The Democratic Party would be considered basically a conservative party in, in, in most other countries. And the, the Republican Party would basically be considered, you know, a fascist party or a far right political party. And I think it's been moving in that in that direction for a, a very long time, um, probably much more so since Donald Trump. Um, but I think I think long long before that as well. So let's, you know, I like I said, I mean, Woolman kind of backs away from this idea of totalitarianism, but let's actually compare the United States to a country that's often considered to be a totalitarian country, which is communist China. Now, like I said, I mean, Woolman, you know, specifically references Nazi Germany, uh, which is possibly even more provocative. Um, but China still exists. I mean, I mean, whether or not China can even be considered a totalitarian regime anymore is not quite clear. I think there's a lot of evidence to say that while far from being a democratic government, um, it's not quite, you know, the government doesn't have quite total control over all aspects of life. China does have, kind of, you know, kind of a comp, uh, a somewhat capitalist economy, although it's very, it's it's kind of like a hybrid economy, or some would say a transitional economy. Um, the state does still play a very large role. Many of the larger businesses in China are still controlled by by the state. Uh, very important. I mean, I, I mean that's important too. But another very important thing is is that, is that the state basically controls uh, you know finance. Whereas here, of course, in, in the United States, finance is privatized, right, in the hands of private institutions. Um, many people would argue that's probably what best accounts for China's you know massive economic growth over the last several decades is, is the fact that the government's been, been able to basically like funnel investment into areas where it wants to see the economy grow as well as of course you know being able to export to many other countries including of course the united states i'm not, I'm not talking about china's political economy i'm just saying china's a pretty good example so how, how do you compare the united states to china I, this is not a defense of china i i, I would say this is a clear-cut example of if not a totalitarian government at least then you know an authoritarian government, sometimes the term authoritarianism is kind of like the softer version of totalitarian. I mean, that is a distinction that is made in political science, but certainly you could say it's an undemocratic government. So how does China compare to the United States? Well, most of the time, of course, you know, criticisms of China are just made without any evidence. It's just simply assumed that China is this, you know, horrible country, this horrible government, it's just doing all these bad things. Um, but when we look at, you know, we actually sort of break things down and you look at, you know, what do people focus on about China? Well, they talk about, you know, the human rights violations that go on in China, you know, the government using violence against people, whether it's in 
Tibet, whether it's against the Uyghurs, whether it's in Hong Kong, whether it's against people within, you know, sort of mainland China. Um, this is something that's often, you know, pointed out. And again, I'm not defending that at all. Um, but what is the human rights record of the United States? I mean, I mean, how many dictatorships does the United States support across the world? Very many. Some of the most notable examples, of course, would be Saudi Arabia, the various Latin American dictatorships it supported throughout throughout the 20th century. Uh, probably the most infamous being, you know, the the Pinochet regime in Chile, uh, but various others. And and the U.S. has a, a long track record of, of of coups, of overthrowing governments, of installing dictatorships, of going to war against democratically elected elected governments. Um, China doesn't do that, you know. I mean, say what you will about China, but they don't do that. Um, and then you have to also look at the massive death toll. Uh, for the United States, basically, just since the end of w World War II, I mean, I mean, I mean, the U.S. has killed million, literally millions and millions of people across the world in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. I mean, again, I mean, I mean, China has not spent the last twenty years basically like bombing almost every country <laughs> in in the Middle East and Africa, Northern Africa. So. I, I don't really think that, that, that the United States, you know, people in, in the U.S., U.S. elites, prominent people within the U.S. really have a whole great amount of moral authority or credibility to really point out, you know, human rights violations in, in any of the country. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm not even, you know, talking about human rights violations that go on within the United States, the rampant police violence that goes on, the 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 mass incarceration state. We actually incarcerate more people than than China does. I mean, like, you know, we, 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 we are truly the mass incarceration state. We, we imprison more people basically than a, 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 almost any other country. And I think as a percentage of the population, I think the greatest amount, in fact. Um, so that's one aspect. You know, they talk about how, you know, media in China is censored by the, the, the government and things like that. Well, again, I mean, censorship goes on within the United States as well. It's just censored by corporations rather than the government. Does that really make much much of a difference to people? I mean, I mean the control of information, that's what's you know critical, right? I, I, I mean, whether or not it's being done by the government or being done by corporations, what's really the difference? I mean, I mean the, the important thing, again, like I said, is the control over information. And censorship very much goes along with the idea of propaganda. And as, as I've already said, I mean, US media in this country is horribly propagandistic, especially when it comes to wars. I mean, I mean, they never criticize anything <laughs> that the United States does. And all these horrible wars that I, I was talking about, whether it's in Vietnam or Iraq or, or, or wherever, they're all supported by the media. The media didn't didn't criticize any of these things. Only when it became like, when it was already too late <laughs> and when it became incredibly obvious that, that these wars were not going the way that they, that they went, you got some mild criticism of it. But in the decisive moments leading up to these wars, when, when you know, criticism would have been more meaningful they completely supported it i mean i mean not only did they you know supported it they enthusiastically supported it they were essentially like you know cheerleaders for war so that's 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 the record of the the us media again another thing is is government spying the idea that the government keeps its population under surveillance and is spying on them again edward snowden has revealed what the united states has done through through the nsa the us you know surveillance operations illegal surveillance operator should be considered illegal at least um i believe the courts have mostly approved of that kind of going back to what wollen says about the legal system being both compliant and repressive um but the u.s operations are far more <laughs> extensive than anything china's china's doing both through its own people and and also across the world as well we're, we're spying on everyone so and the idea of chinese aggression i mean that that, that kind of I guess relates back to foreign policy and things like that which i already covered I mean, we're constantly hearing that China is this, you know, aggressive country and flexing its muscles and things like that. I mean, who are they trying to fool with that stuff? I mean, I mean, what? I mean, as I already said, I mean, what what country spent the last you know twenty years, you know, you, you know, bombing all the all these other countries? It's just crazy. And so again, it's not to defend China, but I think when you actually sort of break things down, you actually compare the U.S. to China today, it's not that great. You know, the, the U.S. doesn't come out very well in that comparison. And I think that is something that people should be concerned about. And I, you know, I would say, you know, the the sort of undemocratic nature of the United States possibly is is most 
pronounced or most obvious when it comes to foreign policy and things like that. I mean, we we are an an, an empire. And a lot of people have have trouble, you know, and, and Wallen talks about that as well. Like, how can you be a democracy and an empire at, 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 at the same time? How can you be a superpower, a superpower democracy? You can't. But people like to somehow pretend that we can that we can be both. We, we can both be the sort of global empire and also a democratic government at, at the same time. You really can't. And there are obvious contradictions with that. And those Contradictions are, are 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 you know getting worse and worse. It's becoming more and more and more obvious as time goes on. But again, I would say that you know the horrible track record of U.S. foreign policy over the years, basically since the end of, of World War II, I would say you know again comes pretty much close to the top of the list when it comes to showing how um, undemocratic the United States re really is. So again, you know the media is important as well. Control over information. You can't have a democracy without a well-informed electorate, and the electorate in the United States is not well-informed. Um, so I'll just run through this re 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 really quick. I mean, I do want to get on to other things as well, but just you know, this is kind of like just a short list of, of some of the major you know failures of the U.S. media over the years. Again, downplaying the theft of the election in 2000, WMDs, the phantom weapons of mass destruction, which never materialized, and the invasion of Iraq. These two things, again, were certainly on Wolin's mind um, when he was writing this essay. Russia Gate, um, something was happened after Wolin died, but I'm, I'm sure he would have, uh, you know, had had a, a similar take on this. But yeah, I mean, I mean, the media spent like what, like three or four years inventing a fake Russian <laughs> conspiracy to, uh, you know, take over America or or something like that without any shred of evidence. Um. Just basically based on conjecture and hearsay, and you know, I, I mean, very you know, un, unsubstantiated claims. Um, and of course, this you know, dominated coverage of the Trump administration at least, at least until COVID. I would I would say you know, you know, the Russia gay thing only really went away when 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 COVID hit, and that became the big story. But I mean, Donald Trump, you know, ran for office and campaigned on this idea that you know you can't trust the media, the media is fake news, blah blah blah. And so what does the media do in response to that? They they invent a fake Russian conspiracy theory. I mean, I mean, they're they're playing right into Trump's hands, basically, is what is what I'm saying here. I mean, I mean, they they couldn't have given him a better weapon to basically use against the media. Um, failing to stand up for and in many cases smearing Julian Assange, an actual journalist who was actually, you know, exposing, you know, evil deeds done by governments throughout the world. Um, and, you know, basically is, is on trial for his life now, has been in prison for several years, um, hardly ever talked about within U.S. media. I think only very recently has there been any coverage of this. But this has been an ongoing story for like 10 years now, and they've mostly ignored it during this period of time. Smearing Bernie Sanders and, you know, and his supporters, the so-called Bernie bros, again, trying to draw a false equivalence between Bernie Sanders and Trump which is kind of idiotic, I think. I mean, I mean, obviously they're not the same thing. Um, Trump is a right-wing, you know, wannabe dictator. I mean, Bernie Sanders basically just wants people to have like healthcare. I think, I think there are clear differences between that. And I, I think oftentimes drawing these kind of false equivalencies is basically meant to sort of prop up this very sort of bland, lifeless, moderate center, which, which basically makes up the, you know, political establishment within the United States. Uh, but there are many examples of people, you know, trying to dredge up things from, you know, San Sanders' past. And again, I'm not I'm not a, a Sanders cheerleader either. I mean, I think he's slightly better than most of the politicians that that that, that we have. But he obviously has, I think, uh, his l limitations as well. But again, just the blatant attempts to to undermine him, you know, all, all the and, and this sort of goes outside the media, but the sort of irregularities and and weird stuff that went on during during the primaries in 2016 and in 2020 i think sp speak to that as well i mean I, I i could say more about this but i'm gonna move through this pretty pretty quickly maybe, maybe some of the stuff i'll bring up again in a future class gushing over An andrew cuomo again another thing from the trump era remember people talking about how great andrew cuomo was in comparison to trump because he at least was taking covid seriously and i do appreciate that but what was the real story? The real story was that Andrew Cuomo was actually, you know, covering up and and, and, and in some ways, you know, helping um, these, you know, corrupt 
nursing home owners basically, you know, kill off their elderly clients or patients or, you know, whatever you could go. I, I mean, it's a, if it's a for, it's a for-profit business. So I guess, I guess they're a client or a customer or, or something like that, but that was a, you know, a horrible thing. And, 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 you know, Cuomo basically, you know, allowed it to happen and, and basically then covered it up, covered up the number of deaths that, that, that were going on and things like that. And prior to that, uh, as, as well, I mean, I mean, Cuomo was a, is a horrible, you know, sort of what would be considered a neo, a neoliberal Democrat in that he basically, you know, again, favors the corporate elites. Um, health services have been, you know, repeatedly slashed in, in New York City, cut back in New York State, I mean, during his, uh, you know, tenure as governor, cuts backs to, you know, spending on health care in the state as well. So hardly, but yeah, people were, were talking about him for a while as if he was the second coming. And then in like less than a year later, he <laughs> like, you know, resigns in disgrace. And 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 it just kind of shows you how kind of like out of touch and clueless people are in the media that they would you know prop up people like that and then so quickly have to change course and like you know distance themselves from that. Uh, the Calfe podcast that's probably not as well known, but that was an interesting thing. A podcast uh, uh, by the New York Times. Basically, they found this guy who claimed to be part of ISIS, and it turned out the guy completely fabricated the whole thing. And the, the you know the podcast won awards, and there's all this praise for it and things like that. Basically, based on a guy who completely just made shit up and was never in ISIS. Support for U.S. imperialism and allies, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Again, a clear double standard there. When we point out human rights abuses by China, but then turn a blind eye to human rights abuses by these countries and various others. Um, the, I didn't list it here, but you know the fact that there's pretty credible evidence to suggest Saudi Arabia may have been, in, in fact been, or at least people within the Saudi government may have been, you know, involved in, in, in the planning of 9/11. I think is certainly important, and to and to this day, you know, doesn't doesn't get talked about. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the Kennedy assassination. I, I could really go down the rabbit hole with that. But I'll just move on from that really, really, really quickly. But again, I mean, the, the these kinds of things, you know, like horrible things happen in broad daylight. We all know the 9-11 happened. But yet we're still, you know, year, years later, don't really know the full story of what went on there on, on, on that day, why it happened, how it happened, things like that. 20 years later. Um, and again, and, and there are some, you know, things in this country's history that have gone on for even, you know, where we're even – Several decades ago, we still don't really, really know the whole story about that. Uh, claiming Democrats lost or really lost elections for being too radical, which is not supported by evidence. Generally, the more you know, progressive leaning Democrats usually do better in congressional elections. It's the more moderate, centrist, you know, trying to play it both ways. Democrats who usually lose, and again, and 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 just the fact that the Democratic Party is a radical party, as as Donald Trump likes to call them. Is absurd. I mean, like I said, in, in 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 any other country, the Democratic Party would basically be considered like a, a right wing, you know, conservative party. Uh, proclaiming the the end of the pandemic three times already and counting. Um, I've I recently read something that we're we're now in basically the second highest wave of COVID cases, basically you know second only to um, Omicron last year. Rarely gets talked about in the media. Again, Joe Biden, I think, infamously said, uh, you know, the pandemic is over. Um, people have, have made those claims, you know, prior prior to that, and, and have had to take to take it back. Um, I think that may happen. I mean, I mean, the the cover up now seems to be so in play now. Like not r reporting on the number of cases, hospitals don't even report case numbers anymore. The whole sort of apparatus for testing is being dismantled. Um, you can't even really trust the official numbers, although some people have ways of sort of, you know, measuring these things um, without using the official numbers. Um, and I think based based on that, it it shows, again, that, you know, cases are, are very high. Um, another way you can look at, it, of course, is that, you know, the number of, of hospitalizations is, 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 is very high, once again, in, in, in this country. Um, and just in general, I mean, you know, uh, uh, apart from any one of these, you know, in individual stories here or issues, I mean, just the general sort of tone of the media in this country, right? I mean, I mean, if the media spent half as much time sort of educating people about the concentration of wealth in, in this country, 
among the one percent and, and things like that as it did following the sort of tabloid antics of donald trump and which porn star he slept with and you know things things like that you would actually have a fairly educated you know class conscious electorate but you know i mean people are are horribly ignorant about economics about how capitalism works even though we're the most you know arguably the most capitalist country in the world mo mo most people don't have the faintest idea of how capitalism works as a system or anything like that and and you know basically you know i'll i'll say it i mean you you, you basically see you know certain types of people in, in this country a lot of people are very you know um complacent and passive and then the people who are very you know radical so to speak you know are, are oftentimes just talking about racism and sexism and things like that and those are obviously issues that should be addressed but you you rarely see anyone really talk about again capitalism about sort of the you know the economic concentration of of wealth and, and things like that and i think those things are, are very sorely you know lacking in this country and should be talked about more um so this is a little bit about Wollen's influences um again based on this idea I'll, I'll i'll kind of skip over this i mean i i will po post the powerpoints if, if 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 you want to look at them but basically you know again where where this idea you know sort of tying it to the nazi regime and things like that the idea that again you know that the state basically sort of plans out how, how the economy is going to run and things like that you know with with the assistance of large you know um corporations and and already you know basically by the late 19th century you already see the, the sort of emergence of these massive corporations and these big corporate um monopolies and, and things like that basically by the early 20th century late 19th century and they certainly played a big role in in, in the nazi regime as as well as did american corporations which were very you know supportive of hitler and mussolini um another view though is that these other uh theorists from the 30s and 40s uh Otto Newman, I'm sorry, Franz, Franz Newman and Otto Kirschheimer believed that actually in the Nazi regime, um, the capitalism was always sort of in the driver's seat, that the government was not actually, you know, controlling the economy, that in fact, that the government was sort of sort of doing the bidding, essentially, of these large corporations even back then i think that's an interesting view i mean Wollen could have gone with that and then in in in, in that case you wouldn't need to sort of invert or turn uh, you know totalitarianism upside down it would have just sort of been a continuation of what you saw basically uh in in germany and in, and in europe throughout throughout the 1930s and 40s or the 20s if you count italy but anyway so I mentioned a moment ago that, you know, I, I think people are sort of, you know, lacking in knowledge of the big um, economic issues of this day. And here's one. This is, a f f at this point, fairly famous um, graph by the economist uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayers. And what they're basically showing is, is the concentration of income within the United States. Now, income and wealth are somewhat somewhat different. Wealth is sort of a broader concept, which encapsulates income, but also, you know, property ownership, you know, things things like that. Income is basically just, you know, your your income, how much, you know, what 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 your 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 salary is, what what your wages are. And um basically what they're showing here is that is how these things have, you know, fluctuated over the course of the last century or so. So there's basically three main parts to it. And, you know, as it says, top 10% pre-tax income share in the, in the U.S., 1917 to 2012. So the higher this line gets, the more concentrated income is among the top 10%. Um, and I'm not an economist or anything, but, I mean, I do appreciate history. And I appreciate economics, though it's not my my field. But there's a lot of American history in this as well. And, the, and this is ju basically just based on the United States. So what you see is very high levels of inequality in the early part of the 20th century. The the era of the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, Carnegies, J.P. Morgan, people like that. The robber barons, as they, they're not so affectionately known as two people. And this sort of basically climaxes in the Great Depression in the late 1920s. In, in fact, the high point of inequality, as you can see here, basically is actually in 1929. 
when the stock market crashes. And you can see, you know, it kind of goes down a little bit, but still stays, stays pretty high. And it's not really until the 1940s and afterwards where you see a drastic reduction in the level of inequality in the country. Wealth becomes more evenly distributed, in other words, post-World War II. And that basically continues for several decades, basically from about 1945 or so to the late 1970s. Uh, where you start to see, you know, and and crucially before Ronald Reagan is elected president in 1980, you start to see it start to go up a little bit. Um, but it certainly accelerates even more after Reagan is elected president and in years since then, again, under Clinton, under Obama, doesn't really matter. To the point where, you know, by the time you get to 2012, we're actually sort of now breaking the previous peak of, of inequality in this country the, the the united states is more unequal now than it's probably ever been in its history in terms of wealth inequality and income inequality um and it's more unequal than any other country basically you know, a, a, certainly any other you know developed economy certainly advanced you know economy in the world and simply put i mean you don't have to be a radical socialist or anything like that to realize that this is a problem i mean i mean this level i mean in, in fact you can read the founders Madison and Jefferson, people like that. And they understood this as well, as did Aristotle, as did the ancient Greeks. This level of inequality is simply incompatible with democracy. You cannot have a democratic government where you have such a, a, a massive polarization of wealth in the hands of the elites. It's just not feasible to maintain a democratic system of government for very long. If for no other reason, it becomes incredibly easy for the wealthy at least to corrupt the government. They have so much money. They can put so much money into the political process that they can basically, you know, subvert all the political institutions to their will. And that is basically what what has happened. Now, it's not a clear cut cause, cause and effect. It's sort of like a mutually reinforcing thing. Um in other words, because the wealthy always had such an influence in American politics, they were able to at a certain point influence things more in in in, in their favor. In terms of tax cuts and things like that. I mean, I mean, this is what Piketty and Sayas focus on mostly is our tax rates, which I think is limited. But I think you know they certainly bring up a good point. Certainly, their their analysis is is very important here. Um, and, and sort of like a vicious circle in that because they have that influence, they're able to you know subvert the government to 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 their will, and as the government is subverted to their will, it allows them to accumulate even more wealth. So like I said, it's not a clear cut cause and effect thing. It's sort of like both things are sort of feeding off of each other. The influence of, of the wealthy in politics and the concentration of wealth. And the more wealth gets concentrated, the more influence that they have. That's why this kind of like this like vicious cycle thing. And again, I mean, I mean, even from a fairly moderate point, point of view, I mean, this is simply a, a, a major issue. And, and again, something that which, you know, long term is not compatible with a democratic system of government. And probably this is the, you know, um, among the best evidence that you can support to show that we are now, you know, essentially an oligarchy, not really a democracy anymore. Uh, so along with this, you see a massive stagnation of wages for working class people. So again, as incomes for, for, for the top have exploded, wages for, you know, working class people have stagnated. Um, again, basically since the since the 1970s, the same period of time where we start to see a, a major rise in inequality in, in this country. So what this graph does is basically breaks it up into two different periods of time. 1948 to 1973, you see productivity goes up almost 97%. Wages or hourly compensation goes up, again, also by 90%. Not quite as high, but high. Almost as high. And then the second period of time, 1973 to 19 uh, to 2013, excuse me, productivity goes up almost 75%. Wages, though, only go up about 9% during that period of time. So again, the previous period of time, you see the, the, the country is much more equalized. Again, people were were, you know, their incomes were going up. Um, as their incomes have stagnated, not declined necessarily, but stagnated basically since the 1970s, you see more and more um, the concentration of income going on at the top. And of course, you see that 
productivity continues to increase, but wages stagnate. Now this, besides obviously being a clear contrast from, from one period of time to another, and I would say very much related to the increasing concentration of wealth in, in, in this country. This also, by the way, contradicts a very big piece of the theory of capitalism. I mean, if 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 you want to simplify things and say there's, there's essentially two you know ways you can approach capitalism. One, you look at capitalism as as a good system, and the other theory is you look at capitalism as a bad system, which of course is more associated with Karl Marx and people like that. Had to sort of follow in his wake. Um, the theory that says capitalism is good, by the way, maintains that um, wages go up with productivity. And that's basically their way of saying that, you know, people get what they deserve, that whatever your 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 wages are, are fair and justified because they're they're based on your level of productivity as a worker. But what this graph clearly shows here is that that is not true, is that productivity has continued to increase and wages have not kept pace, kept, kept pace with that at all. So wages are not fair. Wages are not tied to the level of productivity of a worker, you can be a productive worker, and and your compensation does not match what you're contributing as a worker. And again, I mean, how do these things happen? You can't just assume that these are all just sort of like natural phenomena. That these things are not, you know, in a sense, engineered by people manipulating the system, manipulating tax rates, manipulating, you know, how employers negotiate with their employees, the crackdown on unions, basically, since since the 1980s, things like that. Um, and you can't simply say that these people, well, they, you know, deserve all of it because they're so much smarter and brilliant. People like to point to, you know, Elon Musk and people like that. Well, it's like, well, really, are the, are the CEOs of today that much smarter and brilliant than the CEOs back then? Because back then they were still making a lot of money, but the, the sort of insane increase in, in in their wealth, basically since the 1970s. I mean, how 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 can you justify that? Other than the fact that they're basically just taking it, you know, they're, 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 because they're allowed allowed to take it, they take it. And again, you know, the, the government essentially allows them to do that. Um, and again, I would say in many ways, this is, again, sort of a backlash against the 1960s. There was an, an, an idea among elites back then that the country was becoming too too democratic. We have too we have too much democracy now. We, we have to sort of clamp down on this. We have to sort of, you know, put put the the elites back back in charge, basically. And that is basically what has happened basically since, since the 1980s. So I have a few more graphs to go over, which again, speaks to this idea. I think that people really do not understand how capitalism works. And I'm not presuming you're going to have a, a, a perfect understanding of it even after this, because there's a, there's a lot to understand. But these are certainly some some important pieces of in, information to, for people to, to pick up. So another one is that the, the sort of transformation of manufacturing versus finance or was known as the, the the fire sector of the economy finance insurance and real estate versus manufacturing industry basically uh and again you see another sort of similar thing play out in the, in the late 1940s manufacturing made up the largest part of the economy at a little over 25 percent uh the fire sector only made up about 10 percent maybe 11 percent 10 and a half um, and then again, over the years, you've seen these things kind of invert as well, where now finance, insurance, and real estate basically make up the largest part of the economy, almost 22% of the economy, where manufacturing has declined. Now, we don't live in a post-industrial world, as people like to say sometimes. We still depend upon industrial products, but most of that has basically been now outsourced to underdeveloped countries. We used to be called third world countries. Um, in fact, I think about 80% of the manufacturing workforce, over over 80%, is now in these sort of under underdeveloped countries, many of them in China, but elsewhere as, as well. So we still depend upon industry and manufacturing. It's just that we we mostly outsourced it. Um, and and addition, you know, and of course that was a, a important source of employment for, for people in this country. You know, if you didn't have a college a college degree, you could get a a decent paying you know factory job and you know have a kind of middle class standard of living. And there are various reasons for that. I mean, I think when you look at the larger global context, I mean, there 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 has always been 
a way in which you know wealthier countries have sort of you know extracted wealth out of the poorer countries even 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 back then but that has changed a lot since since the 1980s not that it's gotten any better for under under underdeveloped countries they're still being exploited today it's just that the way in which they're exploited is so, is somewhat different now now they're basically making up you know the workforce basically for manufacturing but another important thing to point out is that um many economists would say that the fire sector of the economy is not a productive sector of the economy that they're not actually producing things of value they're basically just sort of recirculating money around and that process of recirculating tending to concentrate it at the top of course but they're not actually like really making anything that has any real value or usefulness to people and that is a problematic thing as as well and of course what, what happens then is that you get more and more financial speculation going on you have real estate speculation which is of course what brought down you know the 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 housing market in the united states in 2007 and 2008 um and you have even more sort of you know uh, even in, in many ways, worse forms of speculation, financial speculation going on now. Look what's going on with the, you know, the cryptocurrencies and things like that, or this, or the stuff over NFTs and and thing and things like that. I mean, like, like just the more and more money is just being like wasted for basically useless shit, you know, rather than actually, you know, creating stuff that people actually need or could actually benefit people. And and the and the idea behind this is that the finance sector. It's sort of a drag on on the productivity of the economy as as a whole. Um, by the way, you can find this idea not in Karl Marx, although you can find it in Marx as well. But but prior to Marx, you can find this idea in Adam Smith, the liberal sort of you know founder of you know free market economics and things like that. Adam Smith did not like bankers. Adam Smith thought the bankers again were a sort of a drain on the economy, and wanted to sort of you know put as much resources as he could into industry. And manufacturing because he realized that that is you know actually how you grow an economy and that is really what you know the wealth of nations are you know the the title of his f famous book wealth is not just you know having you know a, a storehouse of gold coins or something like that wealth is being able to make things that you can actually use so am i contradicting myself here when i say that the fire sector is a drain on the productivity of the economy well no not really because what happens, even though there is a massive gap between productivity and wages since the 1970s, look at the productivity increases uh, in the second period of time from the first period of time, right? In 1948 to 1973, productivity grew by 97% almost, whereas in the second period of time, it only grew by about 75%, 74%. So a significant difference between the two. And I would argue that the reason why you have a lower productivity growth during that period of time is because, again, a lot of the productive resources of the economy have basically been sort of drained away for unproductive financial speculation and things like that. And keep in mind also that one of the things which increases the productivity of labor is technology. So you have greater productivity growth between 1948 and 1973 using more primitive technology than, than what, what, what you have now. So if if anything, given that technology improves the productivity of labor you should have even you know more productive labor growth or you know more economic um productive growth in the second period of time but instead it's it's like more more, more than 20 percent less than in the previous period of time so that's very significant as well i, I think again so supports the idea that more and more of the resources of the country are being sort of drained away for un for unproductive uses mostly for financial speculation and real estate speculation, which which still goes on today. I mean, this is why you know housing prices are, are so high within within the United States. This is why you know healthcare is basically a for profit business in in this country rather than a basic human need. So is housing, for that matter. So is education. So are many things. You know, which which are you know sort of basic human needs, which are are, are basically treated as if they are an economic uh, commodity, basically. And again, you see a massive growth in debt as as well. So all these things, I, I I hope you can see the connections between these things. So of course, as people's wages stagnate more, um, people go into more and more debt. You can see a greater increase of how of household debt, but you also see a greater increase in business debt, financial business and non financial business. And there's a, there there's there's an explanation for that which I have not gotten to yet. But I think that's very interesting as 
as well. Now, again, you can see the massive increases. Let me move my screen a little bit of financial debt leading up to the economic crash in 2008. That's basically what made the economic crash so, so, so bad is that not only was it speculating on housing, but it was debt fuel speculation on housing. In other words, financial institutions borrowing money from other institutions to speculate on housing and mortgages. Um, and then of course, when that system broke, broke down, not only do they not have money, um, you know, the people that, you know, were speculating on mortgages and things like that, but the people that they were borrowing money from are now also bankrupt. So that's, that's, that's essentially what, what, what made it such a massive thing is that it was this sort of, not just a spending spree, not just speculation, but a debt fueled spending, spending spree. Try saying that three times fast. Um, all right. So according to some Marxist economists, crises are called are caused by a fall in the rate of profit. Um, so that's a complicated idea. But basically what what Marx believed was that capitalism was basically a very volatile economic system prone to crises. And if you look at, at, at the history of recessions and things like that, basically since the early 19th century, late 18th century, you can see that there's a, a pretty major recession every every couple of years so in in some cases maybe three or four years and most at, at the most maybe like 10 years and that's rare so this idea that it's a very volatile system prone to crises prone to recessions and things like that is empirically supported and, and you don't have to go you know engage in complex economic calculations to figure that out you simply just look at the history of the history of recessions and you can see quite quite clearly that that is true but what is sort of driving those things? What is causing the recessions? People disagree about that. Marx would argue that it's caused by a fall in the rate of profit. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's a, it's a complicated idea. But the rate of profit is basically you know, the percentage of profit that not just individual businesses are making, but basically the, the economy as, as, as a whole. Marx – presumed or theorized that 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 the profit rate in an economy tends to equalize and that again that profit rate is, is expressed as a a percentage so businesses are making a 30 percent profit rate right so so whatever they invested in their business their return on their in investment is th is 30 percent and he you know tended to assume that this is true for you know the the economy as a whole but what happens is that over time that profit rate starts to fall. It goes from 30% to 20% to 15% to 10%, 5%, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens eventually is that is that the profits taken in by business starts to dip down and it starts to dip down in a way that they're unable to um, invest in more uh, production, right? A capital system has to constantly expand and grow. And eventually they, they hit a point where they, they can't do that anymore. And then they have to start laying people off and cutting back on their output and things like that. And that basically causes a crisis. And again, if the crisis is bad enough, if, if it spreads far, far enough, it can lead to a, ma a major recession. Now, that's sort of the, the very sort of you know s simplified version of it. Like I say, it's a, it's a complex theory. I don't have the time to explain all of that, at least not, not right now. Um, but what happens is that we haven't really looked at the profit rates so, so far. And none of these charts I've shown so far really represent the cause of crisis, greater inequality, stagnant wages, growing debt, and things like that. You could you could argue that those are all basically the 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 effects of a crisis or 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 or, or the the effects of of a falling profit rate. Um, now Marx also argued that there is a tendency for the profit rate to fall, but that there are ways to sort of stop that from happening. You lengthen the working day, although you, you can only do that so far, right? There's only 24 hours in a day, so you can only increase the working day so far. Pay workers less money, um, decrease the costs of you know providing for, for your workforce, like food and shelter and, and things like that. Find cheaper sources of labor, tax cuts, foreign trade, et cetera. So there are various ways in which you can sort of deal with that tendency of the profit rate to fall. But ultimately, in the long run, Marx would argue that that tendency will reassert itself, and all these things you, 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 that you can do to to stop that are temporary measures. You know, eventually, you know, it, 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 it's it's going to keep keep falling. 
And what this happens is that, you know, this is a poses a problem for how society can reproduce itself. So the idea of social re reproduction is, is, is a complicated idea. But basically, you know, the easy way to explain it is that, you know, think of society as basically like an organism and like other organisms that has to find a way to reproduce itself. So how do how do societies reproduce themselves? How do they sort of pass on their institutions and, and their, their, their way of life basically from one generation to another? Um, well, in a capitalist system, that becomes increasingly hard to do because you, you sort of hit hit this wall or the, you, you hit the ceiling um, after a while where again, capital stops expanding, causes a crisis and you basically, um, you, you, you basically have to sort of almost like reset the economy to, to, to a certain extent. Now, you know, Marx didn't think that, you know, crises were permanent or that, or, or that you know, capitalism is going to, you know, collapse in this final breakdown, which is what a lot of people say about him, but is actually not, not true. Rather, you just have this system of constant, you know, almost constant crises. And a crisis happens, it, it destroys a lot of the economic value that has been created. Uh, like I said, sort of like hitting like the reset button, not completely, but but we sort of you know set things back you know a few years basically, and then you start again, and it's kind of like that old story you know from Greek uh, mythology of Sisyphus you know pushing pushing a boulder up up up, up a hill. And when he gets to the, to the top of the hill, you know the boulder comes back down. He goes back down. He pushes the boulder up again, and just keeps you know going on in this endless, endless cycle. I mean that's kind of almost what capitalism is like. You're you're pushing the, the, the boulder up the hill. You're you're increasing, you know, your capital accumulation. You're you're increasing your profits, but eventually you get to a point where you can't do it anymore, and the boulder comes down the hill. All that capital that was created in the intervening years is destroyed. Things are devalued. Factories, you know, shut down. Things like that. And then once that happens, once a significant amount of value has been destroyed, then you can start to put push the boulder up up the hill again. But the cycle just keeps on keeps on going. So that's actually a different view than this idea that, you know, cap this is going to be this like apocalyptic conflict where, where, where capitalism just falls apart one day. Um, anyway. So this is uh, one economist, Marxist economist measure of the falling rate of profit within the United States. And again, basically what he's showing here, the, the sort of dotted line is sort of like, you know, sort of like an averaging out, sort of like smoothing out these, uh, you know, peaks and valleys. But basically what he shows is that the profit rate has been, you know, almost steadily falling basically since the 1970s. Um, and that there are very little, you know, all the things that you can do to try to stop that from, from happening have been used. They haven't worked or they, or they only work in the very sh short term. And what he argues, basically, this is Andrew Kleiman, an economist who actually teaches here at uh, Pace uh, University, actually, um, is that you know that was essentially what led up to the economic crash of of 2008 that because businesses were profiting less and less in industry and productive enterprise uh they take their capital out well we're not you know our our rate of profit is uh falling you know like i said we made 30% one year and now we're down to 20% now we're down to 10% etc etc so rather than watch our profit rate fall, we're going to take our money, our capital out of industry, and we're going to put it in housing. We're going to put it in, you know, NFTs. We're going to, you know, buy or buy our own stock and things like that. All the, all the various things that, that, that you hear about financial people doing. Now, the reason for that, Kleiman argues, is because, again, they're not just doing it just because they're greedy, although that's probably a part of it, but they're doing it or, or you know, as, as he says, greed, greed is a constant thing. So greed, you know, just saying people are greedy doesn't really help you understand why things change, why you see these fluctuations over time. So basically what he's saying is that, again, as the profit rate starts to fall in manufacturing, people take their money out of it. Most of it gets outsourced overseas, and they put their money, again, into financial stuff. Um, governments have to cut taxes. Again, because the profit rates of businesses are falling, but as governments cut cut tax rates, there are less and less social services for, for, for people. People get kicked off of welfare. The redistributive, you know, activities of the government go away. Sort of, you know, balance out incomes 
Um, infrastructure gets worse. I mean, there was a period of time where it seemed like every so often you were reading about, you know, trains going off the tracks and bridges collapsing and, and things like that. I mean, those are all consequences of declining tax revenues. Lead in the drinking water. We've all heard about Flint. Michigan, um, I read something that, that there were like, you know, ar around the time of the Flint water crisis, which I'm not even sure is resolved, uh, that there were something like 2,000 municipalities throughout the United States. That's, you know, basically towns and cities throughout the United States that had lead levels basically as as high as Flint. Uh, and again, all these things are basically, you know, due to the declining tax revenues. But again, the reason why the government has to cut taxes is because the businesses are not are not are not profiting. And so you see all these things sort of you know playing out at 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 at, at the same time, declining taxes, outsourcing, you know, moving wealth into financial speculation and things like that, all as Clement would, would argue, basically being you know sort of pushed by the the declining rate of profit. Now Clement does not actually say that the declining rate of profit caused the financial crisis, but he says that it's a leading in indirect court, it indirectly caused it. it. It it caused other things to happen, which basically led to to the financial crisis, mostly which was the the sort of like I said, the sort of debt fueled spending spree, which basically led up to, to the crisis in two thousand eight. And, and again, one of the reasons why corporations are taking on more and more debt is again because their profit rate is falling. So the idea of the falling profit rate is an interesting idea, and I think you know speaks a lot to to a lot of the problems that, that we have here in this country. Now, of course, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Of course, there are no politicians within within the United States that, that talk about this at all. Certainly not within the Democratic and Republican Party, and even you know Bernie Sanders, who's you know a Democrat, and, and or people who make up the left within within this country, they're much more inclined to just you know kind of just demonize corporations and billionaires and and, and 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 things like that. And I'm not trying to defend them. I think probably a lot of that criticism is earned. Um. But the, the important point to, you know, to keep in mind here is that there's something going on behind the scenes, which people are not aware of, which is, again, basically that a capitalist system is just this volatile system. And it can't sustain itself for very long. It, could, it, 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 it doesn't. And it has obviously. Well, I, I should say that I should say it can't sustain itself very long without regularly recurring crises and recessions and, and things like that. And if you're OK with that, then, you know, fine. But I mean, wh why would you want to live in a system that is as volatile as that, especially when, when you consider like, well, how do they stop the crisis from happening? Basically, for the most part, you, you have to squeeze the workers more. You have to exploit them more and work them harder and pay them less and find other ways to sort of, you know, get more profit out of them. Doesn't sound like a great system. Um, and, you know, again, I mean, going out of the, you know, economic stats a little bit, you can see the social costs that this is taking on upon people. The life expectancy in the United States, I mean, look at this, like, nosedive the life expectancy has, has taken in the United States just over the last several years. But you can see it's it's generally trending downwards. You see, you know, comparable country average. Many countries now have a higher life expectancy th than the United States. China, who I was talking about a moment ago, basically has a, a at least as high of a life expectancy as, as, as the United States and possibly higher, according to some reports. So all this, you know, I, I mean, if all the economic stats seem like too too much, <laughs> and these are more 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 stats, but at least they're social stats and not economic stats. The the concentration of wealth and all these other things I was just going on about. I mean, you, you have to really appreciate the real social toll that it is taking upon people. It's it's literally killing people. It's literally shortening people's lives. And of course, you know, because people live in a you know kind of brutal, dehumanizing world where they can't find uh, employment and stuff like that. Um, many people, you know, turn turn to drugs, and you, and you see the, the the high number of drug overdose overdose deaths within this country as well. And again, studies have even been shown to, sh uh, to show that the largest that the, 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 there's definitely a correlation between you know opioid deaths and the areas that have basically been hardest hit by globalization by outsourcing and things like that, you know, basically in the Midwest, basically in, in, in these so-called rust, rust Belt states, states, by the way, that Donald Trump won, right? Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana. I mean, these, these states were once the, the sort of industrial heartland of the United States. And basically since the 1980s, if not since the 1970s or even earlier, I mean, these places have just been, you know, um, devastated 
And nothing has ever happened to really, you know, fix things. I mean, we're maybe a little more privileged here living in the Northeast because there is more of a diverse economy and, 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 and things like that. There were, of course, factory jobs here and things like that. But but and, and in fact, you know, many people now work, you know, kind of lower paying service service sector jobs rather than in manufacturing. Uh, but areas out in the Midwest have never recovered. From that. And, and, and you do see signs of it here, too. You see it in Buffalo, New York. You see it in. Patterson, New Jersey, you see it, you know, in other places. I mean, Buffalo is kind of like part, like part, part of the Midwest, but um, it is technically part of New York State. But you know, you, you see the smaller cities around northern, northern New Jersey, for example, where you see the the abandoned, you know, textile mills in New England. I mean, I mean, a lot of these structures are still there. And again, there there's a close relation between that. Um, and drug overdoses, you know, because again, I mean, I mean, people, you know, I, I, I think the, the theory behind this is that, you know, people turn to drugs oftentimes when their, their lives are painful and then their lives are frustrating and unsatisfying and, 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 and they're not able to live a, a uh, productive life. Um, I'm almost done. So you see incarcerated Americans, very high. Uh, I provide some links here. I'm going to run through this pretty quickly because I've been talking for about an hour already. I haven't even gotten to my article yet. So um, let me switch over real quick to my article. I'll talk just a little bit about it. <laughs> I did that by accident, but that's uh, fitting. Um, right, so this is the article I wrote. And, and, and basically what I argue is that, you know, there is a massive double standard here within the United States, right? That we we tend to treat people who are protesting from the left, the political left, much more harshly than people who are protesting from the political right. And I think that's fairly obvious. Now, you know, some people said I was being a little hi hypocritical in, in, you know, condemning what Donald Trump did while turning a blind eye to the Black Lives Matter protests and things like that. I, I mean, I don't think I'm really doing that though. And I kind of say like right in the first paragraph. So, According to er Erica Chenoweth, who's a political scientist who studies protest movements and, and things like that, she said that there were about 7,000 protests related to Black Lives Matter in, in uh, 2020. Now, comparing that to the Capitol riot is difficult because we're talking about a singular event versus a multiplicity of events. Fair enough. But... Um, Again, she says that 95% of them were nonviolent. Now, if, if if you break that down, that's basically about 350 events, which were still violent. Okay. And how many did you actually get shown on the media? Just a handful, probably. So there was more than enough ammunition there if you wanted to portray the movement as a violent movement to, to do so. However, there were still like almost, again, like 7,000, you know, protests according to her um that were non nonviolent so i think um this sort of characterization of the black lives matter as a violent movement i think is relatively un unfounded i mean if you're nonviolent 95% percent of the time i i think to say you know to characterize the, the movement overall as a violent movement i think is un un unfair plus i think it's also unfair to compare Donald Trump to basically nameless protesters. I mean, literally nameless people. I mean, I mean, who, who are the people that were saying, you know, kill the pigs and, and, and things like that. You can't name them because you don't know who, who they are because they're basically power, you know, powerless people who are doing the, the only thing that they know how basically to make some, some kind of an, an impact compared to the president of the United States, who's arguably, you know, the most powerful person in the world. So I think comparing the president to nameless protesters, not exactly the, the the same thing. And finally, I mean, what are they protesting about? I mean, say what you will about them, even about the 350 movements or so, which were violent, which you can condemn, of course. Um, at least they're protesting something real. You know, they're they're outraged over police violence, which is a real issue. What was Trump complaining about? And what was he inciting the, the, the these people to? to do violence about. 
something that that that, that is false, something that is fake. Is this phony claim that he lost the election? So I think for those reasons, I don't think you, you can really draw a good comparison between Trump and the protesters, even the you know five percent of the protesters that were actually violent, because one, they're nameless people. You know, they're you're you're comparing powerless people to powerful people. And I think powerful people have to be judged by a different standard. And they're at least, you know, complaining or protesting about something that's actually, you know, that's that's a real issue. Many of them possibly may have been victims of, of police violence in the past, or maybe know someone who was a victim of police violence in, in the past versus something. So a, a real issue versus something that's just completely made up and fabricated, basically. So I I don't think it's a double standard to say on on my part to say that you know what Trump did is is worse and yeah I I mean I don't condone violence but you know I think you know again we have almost seven thousand um, moments or movements or protests basically which were nonviolent as well um, and yeah I mean I I do think there are limitations with the Black Lives Matter protest. Um, first of all, I think everything's about, you know, I, I just spent like most of this class talking about economics and class and capitalism, things like that. All that stuff is very much lacking in Black Lives Matter. And and it should be, you know, there, there should be a greater awareness of how capitalism works, which which, which I think is lacking on most people among, among the left. Um, so I think that that's, you know, definitely something, um, a definite limitation within that movement as well. That being said, I mean, obviously, racism is a serious issue, and obviously, police violence is a serious issue. So, so you have to you have to understand those things as well. I would say you have to look at the greater, the bigger picture, and again, understanding how these things you know play work into a capitalist system. Why you have so many people who 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 are poor, so many people who who can't, you know, um, subsist in this economy. Um, whether it's you know low wage jobs or being un- unemployed or or you know whatever else, which oftentimes le- you know leaves them the victims of police violence. I mean the most notable instance I think of police you know murdering unarmed black men, and there are you know other people besides you know black men that get killed by by the police as as well. But the most notable incidents of that I think are all had an economic issue to it, right? I mean I mean I mean. Uh, selling untaxed cigarettes, you know, George Floyd supposedly passed off a, you know, a, a counterfeit twenty dollar bill. I mean, these these are these are crimes, so called crimes that you know poor people commit. R- rich people don't do things like this. Rich people don't sell untaxed cigarettes on on a street corner and things like that. So you you, you really have to understand, you know, the the the, the economics behind this that, that that create such an unbalanced society like this, and and the rampant violence that that you see within society is, is i would say mainly a reaction to, to this massive you know to the massively unbalanced nature of our society and i say that because you know i've used this article in class before and many people will read this or supposedly read it and say that the double standard is because of racism and i explicitly say that that's not the case i do not see the the, the double standard being mostly based in racism. I think it's mostly based on people who are critical of capitalism. And Black Lives Black Lives Matter may not be an anti-capitalist movement, but you could also say that probably people within that movement are probably more open to the idea of criticizing capitalism than people on the right, who are all, you know, very much um supporters of capitalism. They, they don't have any problem with how, you know, capitalism works, at least of all Trump. So it's uh I've been talking for quite a while. I, I probably won't, you know, unfortunately get too much more time to go into the essay itself. I mean, I do focus on some of the, you know, historical context of this, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court cracking down again on people. Um, and in this case, you know, overtly socialist people, Marxists who were, you know, protesting World War I. Um, here's a quote from the American Legion's commander in 19. 19- 23. The American Legion, if, if you don't know, is a very still to, 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 to this day, very prominent, you know, veterans group within the United States. A very, very right wing as well. Um, and he says, if ever needed, the American Legion stands ready to protect our country's institutions and ideals as the fascisti deal with the dealt with the 
destructionist who menaced Italy. So he's saying, you know, fascism is great, basically. Hey, we, we, you know, we should we should do what the fascists are doing in Italy. And this kind of tells you a lot about how people's attitudes were in, in the 1920s and 30s. I would argue that these tendencies still exist. It's just that people can't now overtly, you know, gush over Hitler and Mussolini the way people were, were, were doing back then, though. The American Legion is fighting every element that threatens our democratic government. Soviets, anarchists, IWW, that's the industrial workers of the world, a very radical union, revolutionary socialists, and every other red. Do not forget that the fascisti are to, are to Italy what the American Legion is to the United States. Well, again, couldn't have said it any better. So, and I mean, it, it kind of shows you. I mean, I mean, fascism has a long history here within the United States. It's still there now. It's still here now. It's just that they don't, like I said, are not as overtly favorable of fascism anymore. But the behavior is still the same. And especially, you know, one of the things that stands out about every fascist movement is the the hysterical anti-communism, anti anti anti-socialism, which I think, you know, probably hits a little too close too close to home for a lot of people because the United States has been a very, you know, fanatically anti-communist country throughout, you know, its entire history, basically. Um, of course, this is, you know, the country of, of you know, McCarthyism, the Hollywood blacklist and, and things like that. Um, so basically, I just run through, you know, a little bit of a synopsis of these cases. Maybe maybe I'll talk about it more when, when we talk about the Supreme Court later on. I'm going to sort of start bringing things to a close here. Um, again, I did mention this last class, though, but, you know, the, these are supposed to be the landmark Supreme Court cases. Um, I actually got this idea from, from from a class I taught on the Supreme Court. And and as you really sort of go through these different cases, I started to realize it's like, well, these are the, supposed to be the big, you know, most influential free speech cases in the history of, of the Supreme Court. And in almost every instance, the Supreme Court is ruling against people's freedom of speech. So it kind of shows you that the Supreme Court kind of has a shitty track record when it actually comes to protecting freedom of speech, which is, you know, obviously among our most, you know, important constitutional rights. Um, talk about some other cases here. Again, the only notable free speech case where the Supreme Court um, ruled in favor of the defendant was a case involving a member of the Ku Klux Klan, Brandenburg v. Ohio from 1969. All the other cases basically involving socialists, the Supreme Court upheld their, their convictions. In many cases with a unanimous vote. You know, the way the Supreme Court votes is, is that the judges vote, basically, and whoever has the majority, that's that's the way they, they go. Sometimes they're seven to two, sometimes they're five to four. But in some of these cases, they were nine zero. You know, all the all the all the all, all the judges basically voted uh in favor of that. Um now I wrote this article in 2021, and there's a thing about Um, feckless Democrats, basically weak, weak, weak Democrats emphasize a message of unity, obscuring the complicity of their Republican colleagues with calls for ever more funding for this. As trials begins for those arrested at the Capitol, it's unlikely the ringleaders, including Trump himself, will ever face prosecution or be held accountable. So how does that claim stand up almost two years later, a, a, a year and a half later? Now, they have been calls to prosecute Trump, but he hasn't been prosecuted yet. So I'm I'm not, I'm not gonna say I was I was wrong yet until we actually see Trump actually face, you know, justice for it if he is actually charged and if he is charged if he's actually can convicted which would be being held accountable. Um, but notice I said the ringleaders plural, not just Trump himself, including Trump, but not just Trump himself, and that is something that I will I will stand by because you know the the House Committee. Uh, has released its report on the Capitol riot, and they explicitly make this into a a you know a one man coup. They they explicitly say that this is all Trump. It's not the rest of the Republican Party. There are friends, there are colleagues, and, and things like that. And that's just not true. I mean, I mean, there's ample evidence to suggest that Repu the Trump was working with the cooperation of leading members of the Republican Party. And I was right. You know, the 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 Democrats are whitewashing this. They are sort of exonerating the you know they're they're sort of letting the rest of the Republicans get off the hook. Um, 
there's still things that are not, you know, answered. Why did the National Guard wait over three hours once they were called? You know, thing, things like that. There, there, there hasn't, you know, there, we, we don't really have a full accounting. Um, and, and it's very likely that, that this is because, you know, Trump had a lot of sympathy in, in, in police forces. Most of the police unions, you know, endorsed Trump in, in the election, but also has, you know, support within, you know, the military, within the intelligence agencies and, and things like that. I'm sure there are a lot of people that don't like Trump who who are embarrassed by him because he's an, an idiot, not not because of his actual you know policies, but because of the way he conducts himself. Um, but I, I I think that 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 is pretty much true. I mean I mean the Democrats have gone out of their way to basically point uh, place all the blame upon Trump himself that this was a one man coup, and that's just not true. I mean th- this was a much wider thing, and 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 what they're doing is really diminishing you know the threat to democracy that this really represented and what a continuing threat the republican party continues to represent the republican party is basically a fascist political party they, they are basically no different than like the fascist party in in italy the nazi party in germany i mean they are basically as bad as that i mean if if if, if they had their way they really probably would be putting people in concentration camps and and and, and they are violent and they're pro-war and militaristic and all the other things that the, we, we associate with those you know horrible movements and I, I i would say that the only reason they haven't been able to do that yet i i guess it's probably the best evidence that you could say that there is some semblance of democracy left within this country that there are some limitations on on their power there are some things that they still c- cannot do but it's clear that they're trying to sort of break free of these restraints and 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 i think i i do firmly believe that if they if they had their way that they would be doing horrible things you know as, as you know committing crimes as, as as bad as anything that you've ever seen before um and again i i i don't think you 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 can really under, underestimate or understate the 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 massive death toll that the united states has racked up basically since the end of world war ii as well speaking of militarism and things like that so anyway so kind of running short on, on, on the article. Um, I will post a written lecture to go along with this. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then I'll send that an announcement to the uh, class when I post this. All right, so take care, everyone. I can figure out how to uh, <laughs> stop recording this thing. All right, take care.